Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal, and we are here today in the beautiful, incredible, historic Duke University Chapel. And we are here with another historic figure, mm -hmm. the first black dean of Duke University Chapel, Reverend Dr. Luke A. Powery. This building alone tells us that the legacy of the Christian faith at this institution is huge. It's high, it's wide, it's greater than any of us. And yet this morning it surrounds us. Who is the author of many books, Spirit Speech, Lament and Celebration in Preaching, 2009. Mm -hmm. Them Dry Bones, Preaching Death and Hope, 2012, which of course you joined us on Left of Black yeah. 10 years ago for yeah. that. <laughs> Rise Up, Shepherd, Advent Reflections on the Spirituals, 2017, Were You There? Linton, Reflections on the Spirituals, 2019, and he is joining us today to talk about his new book, Becoming Human, The Holy Spirit and the Rhetoric of Race, which features a forward by the great Willie James mm. Jennings. Um, yeah. Reverend Dr. Luke Powery is the Dean of Duke University Chapel and Associate Professor of Linux at the Duke Divinity School and an Associate Professor of African and African American Studies in the Duke Trinity School of Arts and Sciences. Yes, sir. <laughs> How are you doing today, man? I'm doing well. It's, Great. what's it been now, 10 years it's since been you've been here? 10 years. I completed 10 years in the middle of August. Wow. <laughs> have, have there been any surprises? for you since you've been here? <laughs> <laughs> You're stirring the pot already. <laughs> right. Right, cause we could be talking about outside of Duke and inside of Duke, right? <laughs> um, surprises. Well, I think on one level, I've been surprised um, by the overall embrace of religiosity and the expression of faith traditions on on Duke's campus at a major research university. Mm -hmm. I'm pleasantly surprised because um, when I came, I guess I had it in my mind, you know, major research, university global, and, and as we've seen at other institutions, religio or religion being placed on the margins. And here, literally, it's at the center of campus. Obviously, the Divinity School architecturally is connected. And what I found is in terms of being in citizenship at the university, there's been a, a kind of welcome, a desire for, you know, faculty members of the Divinity School, uh, chapel staff to be participants, full participants in the life of the university. So that was, that's a, a pleasant surprise, I would say, that that has been, I think, a surprising, maybe not surprising, but the reality, even as it relates to the book itself, of many of the episodes, racialized episodes on campus that have happened during my time here. Um, from and the some noose. of them you write about, right? Yeah, 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 some of that I write about. I mean, the noose being hung on the Bryan Center Plaza on the same day, morning, that James, James Cone, Cone, the preeminent right. Right. Black theologian was coming to lecture on the cry of black blood. Yeah. Now I saw a noose that was placed on this campus, saw an image of it, and it made it so relevant as to why I can't stop writing. symbolically, biologically, and spiritually. Blacks and whites are brothers and sisters. We need to start acting like it. The Robert E. Lee statue being removed from the front of the chapel. Um, so these kind of being thrust into that history, racialized history of Duke was, I mean, these things happen on campuses, but I wasn't really expecting that to be thrust into some of these <laughs> realities and then coming in as the first black dean and right. and my background and all of the questions coming in um, 
and even early on, you know, where now people know me. So, but why does he sing in the pulpit? How, so a sense that being surprised by that people just haven't been exposed. exposed. Right. People right. just don't know. Right. They know what they know. They know their lane. They know their tradition. They know their culture. And in some ways, not worried about anybody else. But finding that to be an opportunity for teaching and learning. Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless, let us be, let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in Changed from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place. Helping people understand the wide expression of preaching traditions, the wide expression of the church. Right. You know, it's not just what we have here at Duke Chapel on a Sunday morning but helping people to expand and broaden their horizon, understand uh, their understanding of who God is and, and of the church. I, I have found that to be a kind of compelling uh, drive mm. for me over time to say, wow, people just don't know. People haven't seen, haven't heard, haven't experienced. You know, I can talk about a preacher like Gardner Taylor, obviously who's a preeminent a black preacher historically, but there are many people that just have never heard of him. Right. Don't know who right. he is. Right. And, um, you know, and that could be music genres. That can be songs that are just the part of the iPod of my life. <laughs> and I, I could, you know, if I'm in certain contexts, people know what I'm re referring to. But in other spaces, the people just don't know. Yeah. And so I've been surprised by some of that um, lack of awareness and lack of knowledge but then I'm also have recognized you know in my own journey and the realization of the kind of border crossings that I have been compelled to do and called to do whether it's across you know race denominations geographical that's been the life you have to be multilingual you, you know you have to have the be multidisciplinary and be able to you know code switch yeah. so to speak yeah. in in so many ways yeah. and that's been the the reality and the call you mentioned this kind of racialized history here at duke and it's embodied in the chapel mm. <laughs> right you know which is probably the the most well-known monument to mm. the genius of julian abel right <laughs> uh, and, and the history of, the, of this man who, you know, there are two chapels here at mm. Duke. Duke University Chapel. Yeah. And there's Cameron in the Oh, North you better Stadium, believe right? it. Right. <laughs> and, and Julian Abel's responsible for both of those. Right. But so few people know who he was or the fact that he couldn't actually be on campus. Right. Right. To, to oversee the actual building of his architectural designs. That's right. Um, how have you kind of dealt with that particular legacy yeah. while being here at Duke? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you hit it. I mean, on one level, this great towering church, which is a beautiful hot spot for tourists, thousands and thousands. No, it's actually quite amazing right? to come through here in the summertime. Oh, it's yeah. Like, what's going on? It is. <laughs> and, and to your point, though, it is a symbol of, in many ways, colonialism. Mm. <laughs> um, and that inheritance that we have. And, and so that is a reality. Um, and so how do you preach against the powers when you're propped up by the powers? So I, I live that I mean, in those tensions. And then Abel, the gift of Julian Abel, the genius of Julian Abel. Uh, we're not in my office, but I, I have a black and white photo of Julian Abel. This is my inspiration that was given to me the day after I was installed in 2012. And who gave it to me? It was Oscar Dantzler, who's been the, the housekeeper of this building for 25 years. Wow. Oscar 
came to my office, knocked on the door, and he said, I've been, I had this black and white photo in my custodial closet. And he says, now I think I can pass it on. Wow. And so I have that photo in my office, and I used it. At my advisory board was in town this past weekend. And in telling the story in about these last 10 years, I had the black and white photo of Julian Abel, as well as a piece of stone from the ceiling that fell, part of the ceiling fell in 2012, and we've done a major restoration project, but it was fell the same month that it was announced that I was coming. So, you know, we've been stirring things up, I guess, on some level. What, 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 what's this word I got introduced to in your book, pneumatology? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, help me, Holy Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about how you got to becoming human. Um, oh, you know, there's a way when you read it, it, it feels like the kind of book that comes out of a global pandemic. Yes. <laughs> and, and grappling with death, yeah. right, on such a major human scale. Yeah. But also to talk about the racialized politics of that. Oh yeah. Right. You know how we process an Ahmed Arbery. Oh yeah. <laughs> right. At the oh. beginning of the pandemic. The right. Beginning. And and then everything that plays out after mm -hmm. that. How did you get to yeah. this book? Yeah, man. I tell you the the initial, I would say. I mean, in some ways, my answer would be what I when people ask me how long does it take to you know prepare a sermon, I would say, well, my whole life. This book has been at <laughs> work my whole life. Right. <laughs> But I think more specifically, right before the pandemic officially became a thing in this country, in February of that year, I offered some lectures at a Presbyterian seminary in Austin, Austin Texas, yeah. the Curry Lectures. And then the pandemic came and I was on sabbatical. And the reality, the kind of haunting of the beginning of the pandemic, because people didn't really know what was going on. and. And then, you know, with the health pandemic and then with the racialized pandemics, which has been longer than COVID-19, all of these things converge for me because, it, you know, a pandemic should help us I, in the sense that millions of people have died. But if a, and if you are blessed enough to still be living, a global pandemic should help us reorient our lives like to raise the questions about what are priorities for us? Who is a priority for us? What kinds of work? That's why we have the great resignation and people transit because I think the pandemic forced people to say, what do I really want to be doing right. with this time? with my time? Right. And, um, and so for me, you know, we had the head of, of, you know, Arbery and George Floyd and, you know, these things, these episodes that we've seen historically, is nothing new, um, raised their head at a time of extreme death from the health pandemic. And so for me, this convergence of death was a reminder of my own death, that one day I too will die. <laughs> and, and then fundamentally, human, the word human means from the earth that and the recognition that I'm of I'm from dust and that's where I'm going to return. And so in light of all that was happening in this nation and in the world, this recognition of my own humanity, right, which we had a reminder, people wearing masks. We all looked like sick patients in the hospital, right? It was a reminder, a visual reminder of our mortality. And, and so, and then of course, all of the battles about wearing a mask or not wearing a mask, there's a certain inhumanity and lack of Which love of neighbor. Like the lowest hanging fruit. Exactly. <laughs> right, you know, you, you understand the vaccine conversations, right, but we're just asking you to put on a mask. Exactly. <laughs> and, the, and the sense that, and, and for those, you know, there might be different reasons that people had, but for me, the, the wearing of a mask was a, 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 a social solidarity, right? Yeah. Love of neighbor, however right. you want right. to, and our common humanity, yeah. right? And a sense of not wanting to and, and making it a politicizing 
the wearing of a mask to me was a, a form of inhumanity. You know, a lack of care for other people, a lack of my understanding of someone else as a human being, that they are too dust, you know? And I talk about the ethics of dust, which has been so critical for me, the, this idea that how recognition of someone else as a human being, that they're dust, I'm dust, should shape a kind of ethic, communal ethic, individual ethic for how I live, up, live my life in the world, how I treat other human beings. You know, am I becoming human? You know, am, more, am I becoming more fully human? Am I in touch with my own humanity? And I think the pandemic forced the question, the realization of are we human or not? Well, who am I really? And, and the recognition that, you know, we're like grass. The grass withers and the flowers fade. And, and ultimately, um, that reality was so wrapped up in this pandemic for me, you know. Um, and, 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 and thinking about dust, thinking about breath, you know, it for me has so much to do with the spirit and its pneumatology and, and, and life. Um, and so thinking about death and life really propelled me to think about the spirit. Black folks have been theorizing about death mm -hmm. and the sense of inhumanity that's attached to them for centuries. In, in the current moment, I think some of the Afro-pessimism conversation, right, mm -hmm. is, is an extension of that conversation. Mm. So there's a way in which any of us, particularly in the midst of the pandemic, could wonder, right, what does humanity look like? And, mm -hmm. and, but you're not just doing that, right? You're not pulling any, uh, any punches here. You mm -hmm. are holding the church accountable oh, yeah. for being complicit, oh, yeah. right, in this inhumanity because of the racialization of black bodies. Oh, without a doubt. I, I mean, we just need to know history. You know, and how the church has been, as you say, complicit in this. Bap the, slavery was baptized by the Christian church. And, you know, any movement, to, any sort of movement towards hope or a kind of humanization beyond or through racialization, we, we have to begin by telling the truth acknowledging the truth be honest and 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 people and be you know filled with righteous anger if even um and because one has to um you know people have been talking about that often in the church people want to rush in certain sectors of the church rush towards reconciliation and language that's thrown around right as the telos but on the path to that, you got to tell the truth. You got to do justice. This is what's often forgotten. Tell, tell the truth and shame the devil. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Lots of shaming. <laughs> and we want to just jump to, you know, sing kumbaya together, hold hands, right. without the hard work of really acknowledging the complicity of the church in this racialization. I mean, in many ways, and I say it in the book, the Robert E. Lee statue that was there in the front was an endorsement of this long history of, of, of white supremacy, of, of dehumanization of the other, particularly of black folks, wedded to the very building, church building. Um, it's hard for me not to read it as anything but, but that, that, you know? Um, and, and it's not to say a removal of a statue, everything's solved. You know, it's mere, it's cosmetic. Because yeah, you can remove the figures, remove <laughs> the faces, and the same <laughs> evil still be present. Yeah. We've seen that. And so, yes, I think the Christian church, there's lots of work that needs to be done. And, and this was, you know, and others have written about this. My hope was really trying to bring in this pneumatological sensibility, the spirit, and in this conversation to open up possible new, a new way of talking about this, a new tongue, so to speak, or um, a new wind yeah. uh, in this conversation um, to help us move forward a little bit uh, more, you know, in the spirit of Howard Thurman in many ways. Do you think that the church 
is up to that task, right? And, and I'm thinking mm. about this in a couple of ways, mm -hmm. right? And specifically think about the black church tradition. Yeah. There's an argument to be made that the black church has been most important in the United States for its role in the secular world, mm. right? That, that it was a space that galvanized yeah. the energy that changed the country in the way that the mm -hmm. country's been changed. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the part about telling the truth and, and some of the pushback that we see mm -hmm. towards the 1619 project, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This idea that in second and third grade, we're teaching critical race theory, which we're not. I know. But folks are just trying to tell the truth <laughs> right. and shame the devil right? <laughs> <laughs> about race in America. Mm. And, and there has to be an intervention someplace, right? You know, we know there are scholars and activists and all kind of folks who are having mixed results in those interventions, mm. right? Mm. Do you think the church can stand in yeah. and be one of those forces, right, to, to really talk about truth in this moment? Yeah. I mean, I think so, you know, I, and, and I think we see pockets of it. There are people, um, without calling anybody's name, because <laughs> I don't want to miss anybody, <laughs> my friends and colleagues out there, but there are churches that are doing great work in, you know, as it relates to racial justice and other issues, to speak the truth, you yeah. know, to power, to be honest, uh, even as people of faith, most definitely, I think historically the, the black church has been that pocket of hope and truth telling and still has a function to play yeah. and role to play in kind of nudging us um, forward in a, in a fruitful way as it relates to, you know, race relations and these kinds of issues, without a doubt, without a doubt. This is a Christian nation predominantly white Christian nation, mm -hmm. right? we, we understand that history. You tell a story in the book, being here in 2014. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yes. Our friend and colleague, yes. current senator from Georgia, <laughs> Raphael <laughs> Warnick, yes. who at the time had published his wonderful book. Oh, right? yeah, you know, that's right. NYU Press, we're label mates. Yes, that's right. Uh, had him on the show also. Mm. <laughs> and after this speech, your daughter leaning over, yeah. To your wife, her mother, and asking, Yeah. Is dad going to get fired? That's right. right. And, and, and I want you to hold on to that question, but also to go forward now to 2022, mm. where there's an argument to be made that in a figure like Raphael Warnick, mm. you have the epitome of a Christian servant. <laughs> yes. Running for office. Yes. And, and whatever you want to say about his opponent, yeah. his opponent is not that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually tramples on many of the ideals mm. that apparently this Christian nation upholds. Yeah. How do you explain that? <laughs> yeah. The way this is played out? Well, you know, in many ways, uh, one thing I want to say is I don't normally even speak of this nation as Christian. Mm. I, that's where I begin. Um, I understand many people do that. But if we think about the founding of the nation um, and the native peoples that were here, the obliteration of the natives and the enslavement and the endorsement, to me, is not representative of a Christian nation. The other thing I would say is I think we've always seen, sometimes people use the plural, Christianities. So there's been, in some sense, two churches, right? If we think about how the black church was formed in the context of slavery and white slaveholders, one might say, is this the same God? Is this the same Jesus going, you know, going on? What are we and, talking and about? And I that? think historically that's what we're seeing now manifest. So um, it's, in this case, the ideals that Raphael, Reverend Warnock, Dr. Warnock, represents as a, a black preacher, a man of faith, mm. right? A public servant. And this paradigm that we've seen in a, by other black preachers who are pastors, but yet they're also involved in politics. They're politicians. He represents this mold and he has a track record, right? Of being faithful and, and um, what he's doing. And so it's, to me, it is not surprising because it raises the question, what do we mean by Christian. Christian. And there are, there are Christianities at work and different sectors, which we have the rise of Christian nationalism right. now. And the notion that 
I mean, I don't see anywhere in the scriptures where it said God so loved the USA. God loved the world, <laughs> right? That's the, that's the wider vision of who God is, global, right? right? The wideness of God's mercy, the hymn says. And, and so for me, there's the tension in this country mm -hmm. around the history and its, in, its inception and how it's been tangled up with um, sort of Christian beliefs. It, this is why Howard Thurman um, in his Jesus and the Disinherited book focuses on the human Jesus, yeah. the one whose back was against the wall. It's the same idea because people were raising the questions to him, how can you be, you see what's happening in your nation, how can you still be a Christian? And he made a distinction between the religion of Jesus and Christianity. Christianity was the imperial right. domination right. form of the Christian faith. Social construct. Right, social <laughs> construct. And the religion of Jesus really had to do with this poor, oppressed Jew in a minor being minoritized in that context who was in alignment with all of the oppressed right. and marginalized. And I think this is, that's what's at play here. Are we talking about a Christianity or a church that is about domination and control? Or are we talking about a church that is about life-giving service to the least of these? Yeah. I think that's where we're, that's the tension. Uh, Amiri Baraka, Leroy Jones at the time, mm. in his uh, legendary book, Blues People, mm. page four, mm. he writes that the spirits do not descend without music. Yeah. You begin each one of the chapters yeah. uh, with, a lyric yeah. from a spiritual, right? Mm. From, as you say, mm. the, the unknown bards. Yeah. Um, I spent the better part of this morning listening to different mm. versions of every time I feel the spirit, right? Because I remember singing oh. that, <laughs> right? I, I went, you know, my parents sent me to a, the only all black seven day event to school in the South Bronx. Wow. And we had worship every morning, right? So I, I remember us, wow. you know, the 25 of us up in the classroom singing, yeah. every time I... <laughs> <laughs> but coming across that great uh, William mm. Warfield mm. arrangement, mm. Right, oh, you wow. know, which, which is now like, mm. like iconic. Yeah. Talk about why it was important to bring those unknown bards oh, man. into this conversation, right? Yeah. And, 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 and in some ways it makes sense, right? Because mm. it's out, those songs are our connection in a human level to the spirit world. Right? Most definitely. I mean, for me, I think of what Du Bois said in the souls of black folks, calling the spirituals that haunting echo. Mm -hmm. and, and just as he had these the epigraphs, these melodic lines uh -huh, of each uh -huh. chapter, it was the haunting echo, the haunting and holy echo of these spirituals were in my mind. Um, and when I think about even spirit talk, you know, pneumatology, I can't help but think about the spirituals. <laughs> if you want to understand what it means to be spiritual in our time, you need to be in touch with the spirituals. And so for me, it was a way to also invoke the ancestors. It's like when Maya Angelou told one time, she had come up to a podium and nobody was there, but she got up there and the first thing she started doing, she was like, give me room, give me space. And what she told the people was like, she wasn't alone. It was the ancestors were with her. And so for me, when I have these different lines of the spirituals, I'm remembering, it's a work in memory, is that this, this talk about racialization and dehumanization and moving forward and pneumatology and all the things in their preaching and ministry, I'm, my teachers are the unknown black bards. Mm. They don't have any degrees, mm. they're unlettered, they're unknown, unknown, but they're my teacher, they're my wow. professors. And, and, and so with me more and more, I even hear every elective I've taught here, I always have a spiritual title as the main title. And it's intentional because it also keeps me grounded. Yeah. Don't forget where you came from. Don't forget the marginalized, the, the unknowns, those that have, will never step foot on the Duke's campus. And it's the same thing why I have on the corner of my desk, office desk, a chalice and a plate for the memorial to Jesus. But then also I have an Arizona iced tea and uh -huh. Skittles as a memorial uh -huh. to Trayvon, Trayvon Martin. Martin. Right. 
and that's when where, you first got here. Right? Yes, exactly. Here. And so the, it's for me a work in memory, and and a kind of honoring of the unknown black bards and those who have paved the way for all of us, who we will never know, but their tunes, their melodies, their songs, their sermons still speak. You know, they're the muse in many ways. I, I yeah. remember when you first got here, right? And I was like, okay, this, this is an interesting duty. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And, 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 and you never miss an opportunity mm. to sing, yeah. right? It's like, right? So, you know, you, you had this re reputation, right, yeah, to, to, yeah. to sing in chaplain. But you did this series, The Jazz Vespers. Oh, yeah. And I can remember an early one where, mm -hmm. you know, you got John Brown and his, mm -hmm. his folks doing their thing. Mm -hmm. And there was a recitation mm. of a piece that was written by Stanley Crouch, mm. premature autopsies. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. That, that was oh, yeah. performed in a Wynton Marsalis album That's by, right. by the great yeah. Chicago preacher mm. um, who helped give us a president, the first wow. black president. Right, right. Um, how important has it been to really, as you, I mean, you talk about the way that those unknown bards mm -hmm. center you. Yeah. <coughs> as a theologian, as a mm -hmm. scholar, as mm -hmm. a thinking, mm -hmm. thinker. Yeah as a human, yeah, right. right, as a black man, right? Mm -hmm. How do those unknown bars center the work that you do here at Duke Chapel? Oh, man. It yet does appear. <laughs> 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 um, I think we're just beginning. Mm. Um, and it's been, you know, I've always said it's not a sprint, but a marathon. I think the Jazz Vespers as a manifestation of, you know, obviously all these genres, as you know, more than anybody else, you're the guru, all these musics are connected. Yeah. And, and, and so for me, it's been a way, what I found so interesting, an older generation black folks would often tell me, and still do, the young, young people don't know these songs. Well, They're losing right, it, right? Right, right, right. I mean, I heard that 25 years ago, let alone what it looks right like. Right now. now. Right. And so this sense of, how can we bring these voices forward, whether we sing them or not, these songs forward with a, 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 a how can we bring, let the spirituals be the sage, mm. sages for our times, mm. the wisdom mm. about life, you know, history, mm. theology, uh, how you want to read the Bible. Um, there's so many entry points, which is interesting. Yeah. There's so yeah. many intersections. And then to think about their globality, how they've been since Fisk Jubilee singers, late 19th century and, and more, all over the world being sung. To me, it's these songs of the spirit are in the mouths of all kinds of people. And so for me, how do I, it's a way of centering the chapel in the spirit, using the spirituals. And, and, and I was serious about it, yet does appear. <laughs> Uh, what it shall be, because I think coming through the pandemic now, um, and we'll be doing some things with the book next semester through the chapel community and elsewhere. Um, it's a moment, it's a renaissance moment. It's a rebirth, that's how I framed it. Because something new is being born in our midst. We don't quite know what it is, um, but we have, are we listening to the sound of the genuine, as Thurman would say? What are we hearing? What are we sensing in this moment, in this time, and where we are as a university, where we are as a chapel, as a nation? And how can the spirituals be our guide? And I know, you know, even in the black church, when the spirituals are being popularized and sung, there were folks in the black church that did not want to remember those and songs. sing the, those songs, right. the slave right. ditties. Right. Right. You've right. got to be more sophisticated than that. You, you, you know, social mobility. And I, right. I, I always remember that scene. James Earl Jones did this great film version of uh, Reverend Johns, mm. right, who was the pastor oh, at yeah. Dexter before mm. Martin Luther King. And there's mm. a scene where he's asking the choir and the organist to play those songs. Mm. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's there's a deacon who's kind of in the background, Joe Seneca in yeah. the background <laughs> shaking his head. And, and James Earl Jones' response is like, are y'all ashamed of these songs? Are you ashamed of where you come from? Right, yeah. And again, you know, this is him talking to a congregation in the 1950s. Right. 
right? And we're 70 years past that now, oh, yeah. right? And, and oh, so yeah. it ain't even a question of shame now. You can't be ashamed of something that you don't know. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, I, and I, I, there's a loss there. Like for me in my own kind of intellectual work, theologically, linking it to pneumatology has been very helpful. Yeah. Because there, it's concrete, it's rooted in the cultural production of black people, and you can move in so many different directions and say, you want to know, and even in a larger context of, oh, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual, mm -hmm. uh, people would say, well, you want to understand what it means to be spiritual? Yeah. Here are the spirituals. So yeah. do this for me, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, all the theologians will watch this and go, ah, pneumatology. <laughs> all the non-theologians are going, what are y'all talking about? Right? So, so break down pneumatology, right, for, for the audience. Yeah, pneumatology is <laughs> a you know, a fancy name, right, academies, um, word that basically means, uh, we, we would say it's, it's, a, it's the teaching or doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And it really literally means a word about the Spirit, pneuma, um, or a word of the Spirit. But yeah, pneumatology would be the doctrine and study of the Holy Spirit. Right. Yeah, and so that's been, you know, my own work and background because I came up in the Holiness Pentecostal Church, I'm ordained Baptist, mm -hmm. that sort of thread, that theme, that spirit, that wind, that breath, that fire is so much, has been, was so much of my upbringing and a part of who I am and now my intellectual interests, you know, that's been my theme. And, um, and it's been an amazing, it's been an amazing journey. When you talk about the Holy Spirit, right, and and in some black re religious spaces, we talk about the Holy Ghost. Yeah, oh yeah, the Holy Ghost. About catching the <laughs> Holy Ghost. And, and it's a part of black religious practice. You're right. That is policed, yes. right? Particularly in mixed audiences. Most definitely. <laughs> right, a around notions of respectability. Most definitely. <laughs> but your book really hinges on this idea that there's some real power. Oh yeah. In that practice that needs to be unleashed in this particular historical moment. Most definitely. I mean, the idea of being catching the spirit or spirit possession, um, being filled with the spirit. Um, right. And within, giving witness to that. And like, giving that's a, witness. That's the other part of it. Yeah, right? giving witness is really, I mean, it's a beautiful thing in the sense that you, your body, your personhood is embraced by God. You're affirmed, especially in a historical con or even in our time. They might say you're ugly or you're non-human outside of that space, but when the spirit comes on you, you're, right. you're loved, Cause, right? Because you're not losing control, someone no. else, right. God has control. That's right, that yeah, in that <laughs> moment. And I think in a mixed setting, yeah, it's interesting because it goes to sometimes in certain settings, people would think, oh, it's only the holy hush. Is a, is a signature of the divine. Right. But in other churches, it's the shout, it's the dance. It's, right. Again, it's the wideness of God's mercy. It's the breath and the beauty of God yeah. that sometimes we lose sight of and we want to police people's behaviors or their amens or their shouts. And which is what my, I think, daughter sensed at a young age of 12, you know, on that moment in 2014, which I heard about later on in that afternoon, asking my wife and her mother, is daddy going to get fired? For me, it was what codes, what, nobody said anything to her. Right. But she kind of knew, how did she, knew, how did how she, she intuit, intuit <laughs> what was acceptable and not? Because on that particular Sunday morning, you had his choir here, an ensemble from Ebenezer. You had, a, you know, the black preacher and so, she yeah. knew, even Yo, at her young a age. Church in the oh, chapel. right, right. Like, oh, is this gonna be okay, or is Daddy gonna get in trouble? Right. But that's that's the reality, you know, of being in spaces like this, helping people understand that God is not made in your own image. God is bigger than you thought God yeah. was, and that's the beauty. That's the blessing, you know. And even becoming human, this idea is. It's a beautiful thing, this idea of Pentecost mm -hmm. and the tongues and the multilingual and the diversity. That's the gift. Yeah. It's not a problem to be solved, which is often how it's presented. Yeah, All the DEI right. stuff and there are problems <laughs> that we need to solve and we got the data. And we got... No, I'm talking about, first of all, being human, human beings, right? And I'm also saying there's something beautiful 
and this is about God's beauty, our beauty, the affirmation like Baby Suggs and Toni Morrison's, you know, uh, beloved novel, Love the Flesh. Love the Flesh, you know, and um, so, yeah, that's, I mean, I think for me, it's, it's, it's a journey, you know, to, it, and it's a kind of gradual revelation for people uh, over time to be open because people do, can be fearful of what they don't know, yeah. right? And, um, but yet it's the gift we all need. Yeah. It's the gift of the spirit. It's the gift of the spiritual. Right. Um, it's the gift of the unknown black bards. You write later in the book, mm -hmm. what we need in the church and what I have been exploring is the essential presence and emergence of a new tongue. Mm. a new creation in the spirit to renew, reimagine, and even revolutionize our rhetoric of race. Mm. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I wrote that. <laughs> That's my first response. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounded kind of dope. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, I, oh man. Yeah, so this idea of a new tongue, that's playing with the Pentecost metaphor. Right. Tongues breaking out, loosening, yeah. uh, and kind of unlearning um, and enlivening at the same time. But as it relates to the rhetoric of race, this is where I, if race is a social construct, which I believe it is, not biologically real, but socially real, we right. know that. Right. Impact, education, economics, go on and on, housing. Um, how do we, I, I get inspired by people like Thurman uh, who lived through segregation and through racism, but was even his work and understanding was pushing us beyond racism. Yeah. And for me, what I find interesting is I prefer to say, which is what I try to do as much as possible in the book, is to use racialized rather than race, because when we say race, it feels like it, this is a thing, and it is a thing, but it's not biological, it's social. So trying to say racialized, meaning it's something that's done to you. Um, and so this rhetoric of race in some ways, if we're just saying race, meaning it's a thing, then do we ever move beyond it? If it's a social construct, do we, is there a new way of talking about this? It's like Toni Morrison in her um, Norton lectures in the book form, The Origin of Others. She says that her whole life's work was really trying to defang mm. racism. And I think I'm trying to defang this, this rhetoric of race in some ways. Is there another way to talk about this in the church? Not that we ignore it because it's socially real. We have to deal with it, the realities of how it still plays out. But is there a way to talk about our particularities without racializing one another? Because race, there, it's the racialized move that is the dehumanized move and trying to move us towards seeing each other as human, finding a new language for talking about our particularities without racializing one another is really the hope and trying to just open that up. Is there another way? Is there a more human way, a more humane way? Because one of the things, you know, I argue in the book is that the turn to the spirit is a turn to the human, our human particularities and embracing that with, you know, all of the diversities of what that is and saying we're human first. Really, because I think about some of the images from the civil rights movement, the signs, I am a man. Well, it's really, I'm a human being. Fundamentally, that's what the struggle has been historically for black folks. Say, I'm a human being, Just treat me like a human, humanity. my humanity. And, right. um, and you know, so all- When Eric Gardner says, I can't breathe, can you hear a human not being able to take in breath? Exactly. That's all he was asking. Exactly. And, and I, f trying to get to that fundamental reality yeah. again, and, and saying that breath, that spirit, is the same breath in you and me and everybody. Yeah. It's the common breath that we have from God. 
We have a colleague that teaches down at Rhodes College in, in Memphis, Andre Johnson. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. And, and, and Andre, every Sunday morning, will post on Facebook, may I pray for you today? Yes, he does. And so I'm going <laughs> to flip that question to you, right? Mm. Do you have a word? Mm. <laughs> right? Do you have a word for our audience? Oh, wow. You know, wow. In wow. this moment, in this season? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I would, I'm going to channel Howard Thurman, which mm. is what I... In the book, he preached here in the late 1970s, was a trailblazer in so many ways. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. When he eulogized um, Dr. King in memoriam, because of the violence um, of his assassination, he said, we are not quite human yet. And I would say that is a word for us today. We're not quite human yet, but then he continue and he said we are becoming human and so how do we move towards be embracing each other's humanity for me I follow the human Jesus um, and because he is the one who had his own back against the wall um, and he he was the one who um, was tortured you know, and, and, and um, bled and, and died. And, but he was the one um, who told, who, who, who rose again on the third day um, and, and basically told death to go to hell. And in our uh, mind, we need to tell death to go to hell. The racialization, the dehumanization, the, the, the poverty of heart and mind, not just the economic, uh, to go to hell. Because what we, what we see in our time is, is, is we have our technology has outpaced our humanity. And we expect more from technology and less from one another. We can go to space. This is what post George Floyd, we can go to space literally and still not make space for one another. And, and so we have the challenge and the opportunity um, to become more human uh, together. Echoing uh, another known bard, Gil Scott Heron, mm. talking about Whitey on the Moon. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> 50 years ago, yeah. we in fact did have a word, mm. Reverend Dr. Luke A. Powery. Um, we are here in the house of Julian Abel, yes. the Duke University Chapel. The book is Becoming Human. Yes. The Holy Spirit and the Rhetoric of Race. Mm -hmm. Thank you, brother. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate you. I'm going to praise the Lord while I have a chance. Oh.